My name is Patrick and this is my channel 1984. Today we're continuing the Pension 2 rebuild. So in the system we're gonna have this A64 that I recapped uh, and upgraded to two megabytes of memory instead of half a megabyte as original. So it's uh, somewhere between that in value and uh, gold in specs. And we're gonna have a generic network card, our Realtek 8139C. They work quite well for anything. And I'm gonna have this uh, Voodoo Banshee, it's a creative, so I think that goes nicely with the Sound Lost the A64. We were supposed to have a TNT, uh, but the card still has, has an issue. It's like the original uh, owner that sent it in, Axel, noted that it didn't post for him. Uh, but yeah, does suppose me in one motherboard out of four. So this card here, this uh, was my backup option, and it seems I have to go for that. Because this works in this motherboard, I tested it to make sure it works. It has a GPU from another Banshee. That had a, this Banshee had the, the, the GPU crushed by some scrapper. They took all the metal pieces off, so I made a new bracket here. A nice glossy one. And I put a heat, new heatsink and fan on it uh, when I, after I bought it. And put the uh, second hand GPU on it. So we're gonna use this. This is uh, it's quite slow, I find, in Trademark 2000, but it's uh, fast in Quake 3, for example. It's slightly slow in Quake 2, just for to mention some uh, pros and cons. It doesn't support 32 bit color in uh, the games, but yeah, it supports Glide, obviously, as being a TF card. So it trades blows very well with the TNT card. And also this being an SU RAM version is pretty nice. That uh, I don't know how much faster it would be, but if uh, the Voodoo 3 was anything go by a few percent maybe at 7 o'clock. And then obviously for a Pension 2 build you need a Pension 2 CPU. So we're gonna use this one that we uh, took apart very violently. They are a pain to take apart. Uh, uh, I talked to a few people who view my channel that had taken P2s apart and they usually say it was the first and the last time they did it because yeah, they're really annoying to take apart. Uh, you're gonna be left with marks, uh, but luckily you won't see them if you do it the right way. <laughs> well, you should really really not open up up here, try to bend over here, but because that, that you're gonna see, so stick to the sides I guess. Uh, we put on this cooler from, uh, also donated by Axel, and I put on a Select the solar fan. So this is running really cool now. You can't measure the temps. I can't. Uh, doesn't seem to be any diode that you can access at least through my motherboard. Pretty sure the P2 has uh, at least one sensor because it can throttle, but it doesn't seem to be exposed to for me to probe. But anyway, this cooler is about six to ten C above ambient at full low prime 95s. And the CPU doesn't throttle or anything because I benchmarked it against other CPUs, uh, 400 or 450s. Uh, running this as 112 bus, it scores just as well as a native 450. So it's not throttling or anything like that. And for the motherboard, obviously, we have this Soltec SL67B that we recapped. Uh, we upgraded these caps here from 1500 to 1800 microfarads. On our Discord, people are apparently really going all in on slot 1 right now, and they've been replacing these with uh, polymers I saw just now before I went up here and started recording this video. And uh, this looks like 25 to another 50 megahertz for some people uh, on the core, going like uh, polymer. Now I didn't go polymer because I don't want to risk having problems with the VRM here. I'm just, uh, I want a mild overclock benefit here at 450. Uh, I did go polymer over where the tantalums were, but that's just because I hate tantalums when I blow up my face. For the RAM, we have some uh, PC125, 8 nanosecond inch RAM. I don't have much use for it, but in this system it seems to be a perfect fit, so we're gonna use that. It's stable, nice. So yeah, I think it's, that is it. I'm just gonna start building now and put the system back together again. The case has a removable motherboard tray, so put it here on the disk. Due to the layout of this case, we need to start with the power supply here. So we get it in first. If we don't, we're gonna have issues with the motherboard. 
CPU. So the way this works is we put in the power supply and then the motherboard tray comes in over here. So now time for the motherboard to go in. I should just flip it over. So we should probably connect up the 8x power now. So we really won't see much of our pension too in this case, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. Gonna cook up some 8x power here while we're at it. Also, before we get too far ahead, we need to install a case fan in the front. I have one prepared. So I bought two of these fans, uh, like I said early in the part one. Uh, one is in the power supply. And this is the second one. So it's gonna put it in the front here. It's gonna help a little bit. I don't think it's gonna increase the airflow much because uh, it's gonna circulate through the front a bit here unless we tape that off. But it's definitely not gonna make things worse. And I did open up the case in the front. I didn't show how it looked before, but it was uh, holes in the side like, si like this, similar to the speaker here. But having a fan in the front just makes sense. And I had to make this wipe pretty long because the, the air is uh, Fan connected down here, to the ISA slots, which is nice, but uh, because this case is so deep, even included wiring harness on this was too short. And we do need to connect this fan before we can uh, hook up the sound card. Uh, because for some, well, we could put the sound card above here, but if you use it down here, then I want to use it. There's a cap <laughs> exactly where that fan connector is, there is a cap on the sound card. This fan is gonna be RPM limited using a couple of resistor, resistors in the harness. So I don't know the RPM, but it's well, not that high, it's pleasant sound. So we're also gonna put the front on now. It's a bit yellowed, so you can see the sides is much wider, beige. I can't do much about it uh, at this time of year. I don't have like a UV bath and chamber and things like that to retrobrite it. Uh, so I would have to do that in the summer. So next thing would be the sound card. And then we put in the network card here. And then we have the Banshee graphics card going in. This motherboard tray will really have to be careful to make, to make sure the graphics card is fully seated. Learn that. Uh, with this case, it flexes way too much there. Just putting in some blanks here. The uh, originals were missing or falling out. So. So next up would be a hard drive. So I tested this uh, Samsung. It's pretty fast, uh, even in DOS. I tried a new 500 gig one from Hitachi and it was actually slow for some reason. Also tested that I can use, or at least format and uh, partition uh, 137 gigabytes, which works. So we got this Star Trek adapter here. It's uh, 
a little bit higher end than the eBay stuff. You can find these on eBay, but they're gonna cost more too. So there's an actual Marvel ship there. So if you buy these, you want to make sure there's a Marvel ship on there. And you've got Master Slave and Cable Select Jumpers here, and they support up to 8 a 133 So I at least run over 60 megabytes per second over them. So way more than 8 a 33 can do on this motherboard. So the motherboard is the bottom like here, not the hard drive so much at linear. Random is always a hard drive bottom like. Also something I learned is that you don't want a too long IE cable when you're running apparently over 30, over 100 meters bus because you're gonna run fast, higher frequency than the IDE connector too. So like the equivalent of 38 megabytes per second I think. Normal 4D wipe cables, it didn't work. I couldn't install it or anything. With an 80, 80Y one it worked. So the original motherboard, at least in this case, came with this end-to-end uh, -end short cable, and that works too. So we're gonna use very short cables intentionally because I want to run 112 bus. But apparently not an uncommon issue back in the day. I just never seen it much myself, especially not with AMD. So and I'm more of an AMD user. So yeah, I was a bit a little dumbfounded for a while before I figured out it was the cable. It could have been the adapter, but that wasn't the case. So the reason I'm not using ID hard drives like a lot of people are doing is because I find them unreliable. And also, like all the hard drives in general, these like this is a 2007 soft I think or 2009, but uh, ID drives that are from like 2000, 2002 I think the one I tried out for the system originally, a 40 gigabyte, it broke after Windows install. It had made funny noises when I used it in my Xbox trying to get it to be detected there, but it always seems to be the jumper configuration. So I had to find a proper one. Being able to use like a 5 to 10 year newer hard drive uh, with SATA adapter, ID adapter here is a good thing because you get a lot more reliability. If this crashes on a LAN, so I take this a LAN party, I can can probably find a local computer store where we land there is not a problem. You can go to like similar to Walmart in the US and just pick up a SATA SSD and that will work. Since I can run 500 gigs here, it's no problem finding 500 gigabyte less SATA. So I can just like replace, reinstall, be up and running in now a couple of hours probably. I hope that up to ID1. So for optical unit, we're gonna reinstall this DVD. It is the one from 98. The other one was a burner, CD room burner, not the DVD at all, I think. And uh, that other one was dated 2002. This is 98. So I think the other one must have been added afterwards. So this system was used at least from like nine, late 98 to at least early 2000, 2002. Probably longer, which explains a lot of the wear and tear on the fans and stuff like that. We're also gonna install a cover plate and I did find one that fits perfectly in my stash from like, a, probably like one of the new old cases I bought from every case once. So it fits pretty much perfectly here. So you're gonna put that in and align the optical unit with that. It's obviously not yellowed, so you're gonna see a difference. Well, I suspect this is the color tone the case is supposed to have on the front. So when I try to retrobrite it, this is what I'm gonna try to go for. So for the ID cable for the optical unit, I decided to basically take the end of the, this cable and move it here. Because then you get the strain, like a strain relief uh, bracket also. Plus I could uh, get this further down. So this is just to reduce the risk of say a blue screen due to a read, or read error for example. 112 bus. I haven't had a problem with the optical unit like I had with the hard drive. Could just be that the opti optical unit is slower. Obviously with a modern hard drive on an adapter like that you're gonna saturate uh, any linear as country to read and write is gonna basically max out the ID bus. I actually didn't have any problem with formatting or partitioning or anything like that so basically when you try to do anything intense like installing so anyways, that's how that's gonna go. I'm over off this old, I figured I removed I figured I removed all the old glue, but I didn't. 
to the top. Also gonna need floppy power for the uh, floppy drive. There's only one connector, so I'm gonna put the adapter on here that came with this one. But I'd rather have the one from the power supply because if you're gonna have any problems, it's, it's between connections, uh, two connectors. And the hard drive is very important for that it runs stable. So we're gonna do it like that. And I have a function tester. The floppy drive it works fine. You can boot stuff off it. Uh, so I haven't cleaned the proper drive because it works, but I did have to clean the optical unit because the rubber was coming off the spindle that spins up the disc. it's it uh, for uh, assembly actually there's only like the cover left so we can actually fire it up and see what happens hopefully this ID cable works I haven't tested it uh, but we'll find out soon enough the system is up and running everything seems to work just fine We're in Windows here on our Pentium 2 machine. With a Pentium 2 processor, 256 megs of RAM. You can uh, check out CPU C here. So you can see 448.75 MHz, 112 MHz bus, cache, half a mega cache, memory 256 megs, graphics, 2 FX Banshee. And we can uh, run Sister Sandra here just to see how this CPU, when it's overclocked now, performs compared to another P2. So, we're running at 449 MHz according to Sister Sandra, and we're performing pretty much on par with uh, this Pension 2 450 here, on, also on a BX chipset. So, nothing uh, odd going on there. Our P2 is running at full speed. So, let's try some games. We can run uh, Quake 2 here. Let's just select a new game here. So it seems to run just fine. So let's let run a time go. for FPS we are overclocked to uh, 106 on the GPU and uh, 116 on the memory I can check that out here configuration so 106 and 116 so 100 and 110 is stock this card clocks pretty uh, pretty badly so yeah but that's just stable overnight on Quake 2 
and let's run some Quake 3 here. I'm 35.1 FPS here, and we're running mid to low settings. So let's try out the single player game here. Frame rate is pretty good. I locked it to 125 max. But yeah. Pretty decent for a Pentium 2 system. And a mid range graphics card like the Banshee. The Banshee did do better in Quake 3 than the TNT when I tested. Yeah, that is Quake 3. Uh, I did experiment with the audio drivers. There are uh, drivers included for 864 in uh, Windows 98 SC, which we have installed here. So what I ended up doing was uh, repack the drivers a bit. Well, I removed the drivers. I took the Windows 95 folder from the A Gold CD, removed the drivers. And then this file here is supposed to be two mega, uh, 4 megabytes, and I have an upgraded A. 64 value uh, so I originally I could use half a megabyte of sound fonts so so this sound font here would be 4 megabytes for the gold loaded by default but that would obviously not fit so I took another sound font that is 2 megabyte and renamed it to this to this file name here and also removed any 4 megabyte font sound font here and I removed the drivers then I basically just installed what I wanted and it ended up just installing the A control, which allows you to set like sound fonts. So you can use the user synth, but this would be a 4 megabyte font with this name here. But I, like I said, I just said, please, we don't just under 2 megabytes here. You can go generate media and so on and go apply here. But we're gonna have to keep the user synth. But yeah, this is the tool for loading sound fonts to the sound card. So if you play, uh, as it says over here, if you play that MIDI, this is what it will be used. So you can make it sound better, I guess, or different. So you can actually run games like Doom and uh, Duke Nukem using that. This is just a program that sets 60 Hz for any DOS program. So I can actually capture it into my crappy adapter. Let's go. go a new game here. Sound font loaded into the sound bank, bank on the memory on the card. 864 here. We 
Mechanical 3D doesn't need any fixes for the capture card because it supports 640x480 in VSA 2.0 here. This is uh, Duke Nerican on the A64 with the custom sound font. You can obviously play a song using Winamp here, and you can also use the MIDI sound bank here on the card. Also have an MP3 down here we can play. So obviously wave then, not MIDI. And last of all, I want to show my demo here I've been working on, a benchmark it's supposed to be when it's done, but right now it's just a looping uh, demo. And it was really made with 32-bit colors, which Jibanshi cannot do. So it's gonna look kind of craft color-wise, a lot of banding and is issues like that. You can see the banding on the sky, you don't get that in 32-bit colors. So you can uh, you can go full screen here, so you can see the banding on the clouds here, for example, and the sky here. But I'm gonna insert a 32-bit rendering of the same demo here. You can see the difference, uh, how it would look if I had a TNT installed instead. That was a regional idea. One of the reasons I wanted a TNT over a 3DFX card due to the 32-bit color support. But yes, this is my demo, a work in progress. That is the Pentium 2 build. So this is the final part. There might be uh, like a follow up because Axel has told me he sent another TNT, which has an issue. It's like a factory issue, plus it's untested. But if that card works out, we might actually be able to, well, we can then upgrade this to a TNT too.
so you might actually do like comparison to with the banshee in the future but uh, that's in the future we need to have a video i think fixing that card assuming that works out then we have a video where we test the card in this machine i think but for now this uh, machine is perfectly fine there's nothing wrong with it it has a different card than i expected but uh, it's like trading blows with a tnt so it's not the end of the world and it's very nice uh, i think uh, creative banshee so it work it will work perfectly fine so yeah thank you for watching and have a nice day you can join us on our discord server we host public lands when possible and game nights on our server hosting many old classical multiplayer games like quake counter strike and much more or you can show off your own retro lawn or maybe visit our members private LAN parties. We have a galleries, benchmark channels where you can post images, videos of your retro hardware and your scores and much more. So come and join us and share your retro experience with us. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.